1971, I took my entire life savings out of the bank to construct this studio, this glass studio. I decided to learn how to blow glass. Um, out of completely salvaged materials. And it was all put on a 50-acre piece of property that I rented for $22.5 a month. I bought bolts of Dacron sail canvas, and I sewed together a home. And I started to blow glass. I started to work making glass. And I have to say that uh, I was, I have to say I was a Bobby Fisher of glass making. Uh, <laughs> I worked for six years, seven days a week, and perfecting what I thought was the most difficult object to make in glass, which at the time I'd never had a glass instructor, but I thought making perfect sets of matched wine goblets would be the way to go. <laughs> and, uh, and so I did eventually. I made wine goblets for uh, 15 or 16 years before I stopped making them. I did figure out how to do it in the end, but it is amazing. This glass stuff is, is, is really incredible that for nearly 40 years now, it has held my attention. And I'm not sure whether it's the color or the light or the heat or the flame or, or just the challenge of manipulating a molten liquid trying to make it into something that's uh, beautiful or at least interesting. Glass is an alchemic blend of sand and metallic oxides, combined with extraordinary blinding heat. The result is a material that flows and drips like honey. When it's hot, glass is alive. It moves gracefully and inexorably in response to gravity and centripetal force. It possesses an inner light and transcendent radiant heat that make it simultaneously one of the most fascinating and one of the most frustrating materials to work with. I took it as a good omen when I moved to Western Massachusetts, and believe me, I wasn't one of the people that voted the wrong way. <laughs> when I moved to Massachusetts, I took it as a good omen when I found a few antique marbles in the flower bed outside my kitchen window. And when I brought those uh, marbles inside and washed them off, they were just as bright and beautiful as the afternoon they went missing, maybe 50 years before when kids were called in for dinner. And finding those made me think about the longevity of glass, that glass left undisturbed in the earth will last for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. And in fact, ancient glass that's in museums wasn't lovingly cared for by collectors or museums. It was dug up by archaeologists and brought to museums. And it gave me something to think about. The other thing that happened when I moved to uh, Shelburne was that one of the local school teachers asked me if I'd be willing to demonstrate glass blowing to all the eighth graders in the county. And it seemed like a reasonable request, and I said, sure. Not realizing that there were absolutely zillions of eighth graders in Franklin <laughs> County. So what I'd inadvertently agreed to do was give a, a lecture demonstration every Wednesday afternoon for the last week of January, all of February, March, April, May, and the first week of June. Now, I, I don't know if any of you have ever known or met an eighth grader. <laughs> these, these are people who will suffer absolutely no boredom whatsoever in their lives. And they weren't interested. Sorry about that. I mean, except for one. There's one. Uh, and, and so um, they weren't interested in, make, in my making wine goblets. But I started to make marbles for them, cat's eyes and swirlies and that kind of thing. But one Tuesday night before they came, I thought about this photograph that the Apollo astronauts had taken of the Earth as they came around the moon. And Jim Lovell had looked out the little triangular window of his spacecraft, and he'd observed that he could cover the Earth with his thumb. And of course you can. This place that is so large and so um, vast to us can be just a small blue marble in the black void of space. So the next day, for the kids, I started to make planets. Not planets to sell, just to demonstrate. And um, it gave them, yes, glass blowing lesson, but something more to think about. And what I've found over the, and it, so it sort of started me off on a career path, um, making these little objects. I make lots of other glass too, but planets are anywhere from little to big. 
But marbles are amazing. Planets are amazing because they're small. They're little, little creations, little microcosms. Everybody gets it. It, it transcends um, uh, culture, religion, language, and even time. My studio today is pretty modern, at least compared to the old days. And my work is in um, museums around the world. Uh, I've had tremendous, great good luck selling my work. And in the year 2000, this museum opened in Yokohama, Japan. It's since moved. Um, but what I thought I'd do is show you a few close-up pictures of the microcosms, the sort of landscapes of these little worlds that I make. And I'd also like to tell you, while I show you those photos, whether they're of walled cities on the planet's surface or, or underwater creatures, um, I want to show you this little picture of a tiny little goblet, not more than an inch and a half or two inches tall. They were found in the, in the eight, when they started exploring the Middle East, archaeologists found them in the 18th and 19th century, and nobody could figure out what they were for. Little tiny goblets, they weren't big enough to drink from. People didn't know, or the archaeologists, I mean, made all kinds of guesses. Is this some ceremonial goblet? Is it for religious purposes, or did it hold unguents, or medicinal things, or even makeup? Um, no one really knew until my friend, Dr. Brill, a chief head scientist at the Corning Museum of Glass. This is actually a picture in the southwest out the, at the window of my plane. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, same thing on, my, on a little planet. Um, my friend, Dr. Brill, was in Herat, Afghanistan in 1972. And he was visiting a, an ancient glass kill, and there was a glass blower there making one of these little goblets. And he asked the guy what it was for. The glass blower didn't even answer. He just pointed with his, to uh, with his tool up to a bird cage. And in that cage were, what, were two little goblets, one for seed and one for water. And, you know, it was just a no-brainer, of course. Throughout the Middle East, people had kept caged birds. These are extinct volcanoes on a planet's surface. Uh, people had kept caged birds, and the cages were long gone. They had disintegrated over time, but the glass remained. And it, it made me think. I just love that story because, well, I decided to do my own thing, of leaving my own enigmatic, enigmatic objects behind for, for archaeologists. And besides, my work at the time, in the 70s, wasn't in any museum, no gallery, was collecting my work. And I just thought, you know, I should leave my planets around the Earth for archaeologists maybe to find. And... Um, and so, uh, this is a Star Wars defense network above a planet's surface. But the first, the first planet I hid was right close to my home. I, I ride my bike up Cooper Lane every now and then. There's a planet still, 30 years later, in the stone wall beside the road. And then as I began to travel further for ho from home, uh, this is my oldest son, uh, who's now 26. He and I had just hidden the planet underneath this bridge I had bought. Um, just north of here, actually. Um, but I started hiding planets everywhere I would go, whether it was in churches or um, monasteries or mosques and inside. It's a B-1 bomber. I left one there. It's, that planet might be in Baghdad by now. Um, um, this is inside Howard Hughes' Spruce Goose airplane behind the avionics panel. It's actually another one hidden in another part of the plane. But as I, as I had friends who were going to go to interesting places, I'd ask them if they'd bring along a planet to hide. And that's how planets got to places that are right out in the open sometimes. It's the Horton River up way north above the Arctic Circle, um, or on big Almaty Lake in Kazakhstan. Nice, I like. <laughs> and in uh, caves, and even at the base camp of Mount Everest, and then, <laughs> I'm so dumb sometimes, I realize that if you really want archaeologists to find your work, you should hide it where archaeologists go. <laughs> and uh, so, so that's how planets ended up in Machu Picchu and, and lots and lots of uh, archaeological places. That, that was a, a focus for a number of years. And uh, castles, especially the moats in castles, because that's, that's where they're going to go, right? I mean... And, uh, and then there were obvious places, 
and, and, and then I kept thinking about future archaeological sites. Uh, this is the Bethlehem Steel Plant in, uh, in Pennsylvania. And, but then, with the advent of the Internet, in 2000, I started, I started calling it the Infinity Project. I put it on my website. And if you, if you write in and tell me where you'd like to propose to hide a planet, we'll, I'll actually, if I like your idea, I'll send you two, one to keep and one to hide. And that's how they started to really get, get around the world. Um, these women took a planet up uh, to the caldera of Mount Fuji. And uh, this is the, actually the confluence of the um, uh, American and Eu uh, European tectonic plates in Iceland. And this is in the South China Sea on the salute, uh, on the wreck of a, 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 a Navy ship that was sunk in World War II. But this really enhanced my ability to, to have pieces, uh, pieces under the ocean. The folks at Woods Hole Oceanographic started taking planets down in the Alvin, leaving them. They're going to be harder, I admit, they're going to be harder for people to find. <laughs> um, but here's a planet um, in the Azores at the foot of a volcanic vent. And uh, I had just about gotten... Uh, gotten the folks at Woods Hole to have a planet on, in every ocean except the Aegean Sea. But just a couple of years ago, I lucked out because one of my friends was going to Greece and she was on uh, the Sea Diamond um, uh, boat that unfortunately hit a reef and went to the bottom with those planets uh, in the Aegean Sea. Um, she didn't go. She escaped, but she couldn't bring her planets with her. So... Um, Thanks, Katie. Um, um, and, of course, the North... I, then I, I wanted to have planets be in the furthest reaches of the world, so the North Pole and the South Pole were pretty obvious choices. And uh, here, Ernest Shackleton's grave <laughs> on South Georgia Island. And, and here's, a, here's a sort of a typical kind of thing. This is actually me climbing up uh, the canyon wall from the Grand Canyon. And I'm trying to reach the Anastasi granaries. And they, they don't hold grain anymore, but now one of them at least has a planet. <laughs> More obvious places. Um, this is, uh, the next one, the next slide is a little, uh, well, it's an abandoned British fort in uh, Bundi, India. And it's been completely taken over by a tribe of monkeys. And uh, so they, they helped hide a planet one day. And I'd like you to keep an eye on the statue to the left of the main door. This is the, the traditional uh, palace of the king of Sweden in Stieninga. And uh, that planet is right there. But it really helps to have somebody on the inside helping you with these jobs because getting this up in the rafters of the Yerkes Observatory would have been tough for me to do. Similarly, uh, this is in the home uh, and the desk of uh, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, um, who is a pretty well-known um, uh, father of theoretical astronautics in Russia, in Russia uh, and Peter Diamantis with his planet. Um, I've been fascinated with space for a lot of reasons, but, um, but in this case, I hit a planet in the rocket nozzle of a Saturn V rocket. And, and another... Uh, a big challenge for me, and a personal goal, was to hide one here. And uh, it, I did actually get invited to the White House. We had uh, a brunch there and in the state dining room. If you keep an eye on those two pillars there, you can see a planet. <laughs> um, probably the best way that I have to, to get planets into really remote locations is when I learned to fly. I had a special window installed in the airplane. <laughs> and uh, th here, here I'm flying up uh, from the Tasman Sea inland on the Wanganui River on the North Island of New Zealand, not, not in that plane, but in another plane, dropping planets into the water. And then I had, really, it was only <laughs> so like two years ago, I finally figured it out. If you want to hide, if you, if you want planets to be in a museum, you've got to hide them in museums. And, and so... <laughs> So this, this is the granddaddy of all, all uh, glass museums. It's the Corning Museum of Glass. And um, here I am outside the, um, the director's window. 
and bearing it. And this actually was found. It was unearthed by the uh, museum staff, and uh, they, this, they, they displayed it in the museum. It was really cool. <laughs> Lifelong goal, and it turned out to be pretty easy. Of course, one of the greatest challenges was, was getting a planet to leave the Earth. And, and so, um, turns out NASA is not really cooperative about doing these kinds of projects. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it's a big military, it's, you know, it's a, it's a big organization, it's tough. Uh, but I found a way around it. I married an astronaut. <laughs> and uh, you always wondered, didn't you? Um, <laughs> um, so, I have a photograph here of Katie and uh, her Russian crew. And I want you to know that I do make actually lots of other work. Planets are only a small part of what I do. I make vases and tektite pieces and sculptural pieces. Um, this one's called, When I Die, I Want to Go Quietly, the way my grandfather did in my sleep, not screaming like all the passengers in his car. <laughs> my, my, latest, my latest pieces are... Uh, are large platters that are meant to evoke at least a feeling of Hubble or Chandra uh, images from space. And uh, it's a complex formula of colloidal silver glasses, but they're really fun and really frustrating to use. And I'd love to have you meet my wife. This is Katie Coleman. Katie, in 1990 or 91, applied for what seemed like the most impossible dream job to, um, to become an astronaut. And in 1992, out of 2,700 applicants, they chose three women to be uh, astronauts. And so Katie has gotten to fly on space shuttle twice, and, and her next flight will be aboard a Russian Soyuz spacecraft. And I'm just gonna finish because I know how important this is to you guys to know um, how you would eat gummy bears Maybe it's not going to show. Uh, I don't think this movie's going to show. Is that again? Oh, maybe it will now. Think so? No. Well, I'm sorry. You're not going to get to see how gummy bears eat oh. in space. You, it's a great little movie because Katie. Uh, has a handful of gummy bears, and she lets them go, and they float. And then she comes around just like a shark and eats them. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a maybe seven seconds long. Thank you very much, guys.